Well, welcome everybody. It's Tuesday night, time for Nonfiction Book Club, and thank you all for being here. Gosh, we've got uh, Stray Kitten, Hello Tofu, Scott Hummer. Just saw Scott over on uh, uh, the Roaming Preppers channel. Welcome to you all. Hello Tofu, fantastic moderator, uh, just outstanding. Scott as well, and one of my great moderators. Diana too, welcome. So anyhow, tonight's not going to be a very long one. Just I want to start off first with a correction. I put out an, uh, a video earlier today on uh, Hello Tofu, and uh, I put that uh, um, a, a video out earlier today, what to do before, during, and after an earthquake. And evidently, the information that ChatGPT and my research gave me was incorrect. I said that, uh, you know, one of the things it recommended was uh, to be under a uh, door frame and especially a load-bearing door frame. I didn't say stand, but I, I guess it could be interpreted that way. Acer Rubrum uh, did a fantastic job, provided me with all kinds of information to show me that I was wrong, uh, that the number one thing is not to seek out a, a doorway or get under a, a piece of furniture or anything. Number one thing is to get down so that you aren't thrown about, uh, especially at my age, uh, when it's going to be tilty and shaky and everything else, and we don't have that much stability. So thank you very much for those corrections, Acer. I greatly appreciate it. I don't want to, you know, so so if I'm wrong, I'll, I'll admit it. I don't want to put out bad information. You know, this is too, people's lives are just way too important uh, to put out bad information and then kind of get pissy about uh, defending yourself. You know, in reality, if the information is out there and, and what I said was wrong, it's, it's, it's dated. Um, evidently, I got my information from, from chat GPT. Now, I didn't disagree with it because back in my day, back in Mon when I was in Monterey during the uh, Watsonville Gurneyville uh, earthquake, that was the prevailing thought because I guess, and, and reading the history of it, evidently, hello, Mitch J and Moonsprout, evidently there was an adobe building and the only thing that was left after the earthquake was the wooden frame of the door. And so they said that that would be a safe place. So thank you, Acer, for the correction. I greatly appreciate it. I also, uh, in the comments, said, gosh, this guy really sounds like he knows what he's talking about, and I would love to interview you and get uh, get some more in-depth information about what to do before, during, and after an earthquake. So uh, that, that invitation does stand, and, and when I find somebody who knows more about something than I do, I want to talk to them. I want to learn what they know. So that's, uh, that's how it goes. Cryptic, hello from New Zealand. My God, you guys have had uh, two uh, Category 7 uh, earthquakes here in the last 48 hours, both of them off the, uh, what is it, the um, the islands? I, I want to say some like Keberdeck or something like that, islands uh, just north of New Zealand, uh, two 7.0s, my God. And then there was a third one right after that uh, off the west coast of Sumatra, uh, which is the, the westernmost uh, and northernmost. Uh, no, I guess it's not northernmost because maybe Sulawesi and uh, Irian Barat. No, Irian Barat's not. Sulawesi is probably further north than uh, uh, used to be called the Celebes um, than Sumatra. But Sumatra is the furthest west. And so, the, you know, Krakatoa, west of Sumatra, you know, actually it was west of Sumatra, not Java. But anyhow, um, they had a 7.0. So, so, gosh, you guys have been really getting hit hard. Um, Let me see. Little Lone Prepper, welcome. Um, and gosh, great to see you. Okay, so let me just kind of introduce these books, and then uh, we won't do that much into it. I'm going to give you some time to get them. Uh, links will be in the com in the uh, show description down below, the, the uh, additional information. Hello, Holly. So we're going to be discussing, and it's not going to be very long. This is, my bookmark is, is at the end of the first two chapters, so it's not a very big book. It's only 10 chapters. It'll take us five five weeks to go through the 10 chapters. Uh, I am very impressed with chapter two. Chapter one was kind of, eh, you know, like the last book, I was really impressed with chapter one. This book, I'm really impressed with chapter two. So in this book, chapter one is water and chapter two is uh, essentials, uh, food. And it goes through, it has, no, I'm sorry, let me see here. Emergency prepared. So uh, writing an emergency response plan or an emergency action plan. So it has some great uh, uh, outlines for you to use to come up with your disaster response plan. How are you going to react 
uh, should something happen. If you have a written plan, that's that's going to be the best thing. That's better than trying to formulate it in your mind as it's happening, because that's going to give you an opportunity to go back and take take a look at it, especially if you have a checklist. Do this, then this, then this. And, you know, think that through. Uh, things like frequencies you're going to use for either FRS, GMRS, or, or CB radio or whatever. Or if you're going, if you think that you're going to have repeaters up for your Yesu or Baofeng, you know, what, what repeater frequency are you going to be on? Uh, all those different things need to be thought of ahead of time. Are you going to use code words for different locations and where you're going to meet? That needs to be discussed ahead of time. Um, you know, uh, what are some of the response challenges and responses you're going to have let's say if somebody comes up to your house and it's somebody you know what's the challenge response for them to say that they are being followed don't let them in or the challenge and response that says hey the coast is clear let me in and and then the same thing when i respond to that uh my response being either hey the coast is clear come on in or hey i'm answering the door under duress, do not come in, come rescue me. So those kinds of things need to be thought out ahead of time. This book has a fantastic outline on what you need to do to write that. So we'll be discussing that in more detail next week. Uh, let me see. Let me check real, real quick and just make sure I've got my, my, my mind together. Um, so uh, has a, it starts off with a fantastic Carl Sagan quote, and it says, extinction, extinction, these new teeth, extinction is the rule, survival is the exception, and we want to be exceptions to everything. Um, so anyhow, and in the book, it also has uh, some more checklists, and it has a QR code so that you can do your own uh, once you buy the book, you have access to all of his documents and plans and outlines for emergency response plans and all that kinds of stuff. And it's just, it's phenomenal. It, it, it's well thought out. Uh, at some of the chapters, I wish they were a little bit longer, but, you know, I mean, this is going to be old hat in some things. In some ways, it's going to be some easy new stuff. So chapter one is, when is it going to be better to stay inside than it is to go outside? So What's the difference between hunker down and bugging out? How do you make the decision? When do you make that decision? Why would you make that decision? So that's all chapter one. Chapter two is emergency preparedness base, uh, basics. So what kind of critical in information do you need? How do you organize your group? And then how do you develop an emergency response plan and uh, publish that? And uh, the one thing I do like is is kind of like, I don't know if any of you have ever read this, the, the Catholic Catechism. At the end of every major uh, area, it has key concepts at the end, you know, little bitty bullet points. It says, remember this. This, this is super important. These are the things to remember. Well, at the same thing, at the end of this book, uh, or at the end of each chapter of this book, let me find one here for you. Um, so, for example, the key cap chapter concepts at the end of chapter two. And so just great. So we're going to do this book first, uh, When Crisis Hits Suburbia. And that'll take us five weeks starting next week. And then when we're done with that, we're going to do his other book. And it's about the same size, a little bit larger, but it's a uh, prepare your home for a sudden grid down situation. So what are the, some of the things you need? This is going to be especially good for hunker down situations. Uh, so you're not going to, both of these, we're going to be focusing on staying inside, taking care of yourself in your best place to, to resist uh, civil war, financial collapse, uh, terrorism, any of those kinds of things. Your best bet is going to be to stay where you are. Uh, I would probably only evacuate if I needed to get away from fallout, uh, if I needed to get away from a flood, a fire. I'm on top of the hill. Floods aren't going to affect me that much. Uh, there's not that much wooded area around me. There's now we do have grass fires, but they burn fast and, and quick. Uh, and we do, I do have a lot of pasture land around me. So, uh, you know, that, that is a threat, but, um, probably only during August and September when it's really, really dry. Uh, but they do keep the pastures pretty well clipped, cut for the hay and everything. So they will get three cuttings a year of hay, uh, from the pastures around here. So that's kind of where we are. He does have a third book. I'll let you tell me if you want to do it or not. The third book is basically uh, recommendations, his recommendations on how to acquire and store long-term survival food. 
Uh, so let's let's uh, you know check out these two books. I did not order the third book. You can get all three of them as a set and get a uh, reduced price if you get the entire set. I didn't do that. I just got the first two. Uh, and I'll let you determine whether or not you want me to do book three. So let me catch up here with the chat. And that's kind of all I have for this evening. And we can go now for open chat if you want to. Or uh, I'll let you uh, let you go do whatever you need to do on a Tuesday evening. Let me see here. Uh, a bunch of, whole bunch of hellos, cryptic, uh, Scott Hummer. I need to get Scott Hummer on and interview him, Holly Cryptic. Uh, I'm thinking out loud. Sometimes that gets me in trouble. Marie 2024, hello. Uh, yes, The Lost Ways is an excellent book. And that's a great su suggestion. I will put it in my planner and we'll do that one after we finish these two or three. Great suggestion. Uh, I may have a different version of what everybody else has. Mine was one of the originals. Uh, I have a first edition copy of that. So uh, if, if you can live with me having a first edition, I think the third edition is out now with some updates. So if you can live with me having a first edition while you have a third edition, that will work. Uh, we can do that. Um, let me see here. Yeah, I'm a checklist kind of guy. As a matter of fact, that, that video I just put out on what to do before, during, and after a, um, a hurricane, a hurricane, a, an earthquake. <clears throat> I also put in the, uh, uh, oh gosh, ready.gov slash kits. And it's got the two page PDF checklist of all the things you need to have in your emergency go bag if you have to evacuate your home because of uh, something happening. Uh oh. Uh, Mary Greeley News just sent me an alert, and it says earthquake swarm in North New Zealand after another devastating 5.9 quake. So you guys in New Zealand are getting getting hit hard. Uh, for those of you, I, I'll put the link in the in the show notes below. But there is usgs.com/slash. I think it's earthquake map. Just just go to Google or to DuckDuckGo and put USGS earthquake map. I'm starting to sound like Father Link, my, my English teacher in, in high school. Uh, he had dentures, and every time he said an S, he whistled. And uh, I now have these implants, and but it's kind of like a permanent denture. So every time I get up to do an S, I whistle too. And, and gosh, it reminds me of Father Link. I never thought I'd make it to that. But, you know, that's how life goes. Um, let me see here. Yes, uh, the, the, the Lost Ways is a phenomenal book, and it does go back to a lot of, um, I'm going to say pioneer days or, or old West days, things that they did. That's, you know, they're going to talk about the three sisters where you can grow corn, squ uh, pole beans, and squash all in the same hole. That's what the Native Americans did, uh, and that would provide ground cover. It would provide each one required a different nutrient and as a waste product, produce nutrients that the others needed. So it was a symbiotic relationship among those three and a lot of other things that they did. Um, so there's, there's a lot of bushcrafting uh, skills in it. There's a lot of great skills, canning, cooking, uh, things like that. Um, oh, wow. Make me jealous. Uh, yeah, I'm, I've got uh, I've got a horse ranch on one side of me, uh, a cattle ranch on one side of me, and a horse ranch. No, I've got two horse ranches, one on one side, one on the other side, and then a cattle ranch behind. And uh, then off over here, uh, about a mile is the river. So it's pretty much, uh, uh, it's not well, not that well developed. It, it's it's pretty much raw land, but uh, you know we it is starting to get developed. Uh, so, yeah, I'm kind of in the same situation, even though we're kind of like a standalone little community. We've got about 120 houses here, 120 families in this little suburb. Uh, I think that's all of us. We prefer not to bug out, especially after I just had my extra eight panels installed uh, for, for my uh, uh, solar system. And here's, here's a real uh, SH, you know, uh, I-T-T-Y situation. 
uh, my bug control guy, you know, my, my lawn spraying guy and all that kinds of stuff came in and he yanked on his hose and you know, my brand new, uh, water catch system, catchment system, uh, when he pulled his hose, it was caught on my my uh, overflow tank for my water catchment system that's only two, three weeks old, and he ripped it off. And uh, so I said, okay. I said, here's what it is. He says, look, it's my only second. It's only my second day on the job. You know, don't don't turn me in. They'll fire me. I said, okay. I said, look, all I want is I want it fixed. I don't care how it gets fixed. Just, you know, as long if you want to fix it, that's fine. If you want your company to fix it, that's fine. You tell me which way you want to go. So he came back Sunday and he brought some PVC glue and everything else. Not the best job repairing it, but he made a, a sincere attempt and, and it's going to be workable. You know, I'm, I mean, aesthetically, it's not pleasing. You can tell that it's been busted and all that kinds of stuff. But, you know, but he did leave the uh, the PVC uh, cleaner and, and, and glue and and uh, waterproofing agent for me. So I guess I have I, I, I maybe I came out a little bit ahead. I don't know. Um, can I suggest a book on the Great Depression? No, I, yes, I can. Yes, I can. It's called The Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum, B-A-U-M. So most people don't realize that it was a, a, a Great Depression book. And um, oh, what was her name? Dorothy. Dorothy did not have ruby slippers. She had silver slippers. And the reason that I think it was MGM changed it to Ruby was because, remember, the first five, ten minutes of the movie is in black and white. And then Technicolor came out. And so they wanted to show Technicolor. And silver didn't show up as nice on Technicolor as Ruby Red slippers did. So they changed it from silver to Ruby Red. But there's a whole bunch of symbolism uh, in L. Frank Baum's book, The Wizard of Oz, because what he's talking about is he's talking about the gold and silver standards. So the golden, the golden brick road, right? Silver slippers. So the silver slippers are walking on the golden brick road. Uh, then you have basically some key heroes. So you had uh, the Fed, which is represented by the wizard. The Fed was doing all kinds of manipulative things. And, uh, you know, so that's the manipulation of, of Oz and all that kinds of stuff. Uh, you had the good witch and the bad witch, and these were people who were fighting for different things in Congress. You had, uh, um, I forget who it is, they, one of the senators, they called the Lion of the Senate, and that's the lion who had no heart. No, the lion who had no courage. He, he was from, I believe, Nebraska, and refused to stand up uh, and, and dissolve the, uh, the Fed. And then you had uh, basically farmland, farm, you know, which was which was rural America. The majority of America was against the Federal Reserve, and so they are interpreted as the doofs, the imbeciles, the idiots who don't know what they're talking about. And so they're the straw men with no brains. Whereas the manufacturing eastern portion of the country was represented by the tin man, right? The uh, uh, and, and so he needed his oil and everything else because he was mechanical and, and manufactured. So, so this great manufacturing empire, primarily in the Rust Belt, uh, had no heart. So they didn't care about the people out west. All they cared about was making money. So it's, it's the story of the conflict between rural America versus urbanized, uh, mechanized, um, materialistic uh, urban centers and how the politicians did not represent the people or didn't have the courage to represent the people and how we needed to be on a gold and silver standard, but everybody wanted to take us off of it. So yes. So I recommend the wizard of Oz. If you understand the, uh, all the sing, uh, uh, <clears throat> symbolism in it, I will put a link there. There is a fantastic video uh, on the wizard of Oz and what it really means here on YouTube. And I'll put a link to that. Uh, in the show notes down below. It's just a great, great video. Uh, so that's a great book to read about the, about the Great Depression. Now, I will also recommend, there's another fantastic book, and it's Claire's uh, D Great Depression Cookbook. Uh, so she used to have a YouTube channel. She was in her 90s when she passed away. Her grandson videotaped her doing Great Depression cooking and what they did to save money eating during the Great Depression. And then they put a uh, 
uh, out, she put out a cookbook just before she passed away. And it's Great Depression Cooking. So I think that would be beneficial to you as well. I'll put a link to that uh, on Amazon down below uh, in the show notes as well. So those are the two that I would recommend. Oh, wow, you found the video. Thank you, Hello Tofu. Uh, that's fantastic. Is, let me make sure that that's the right one. Um, let me see. I don't know if I can get it. I can't, I can't link to it. Uh, hopefully that's the right one. Uh, what's the guy's name who does the uh, narration on it? Uh, if somebody can click on that and, and tell me the name of the guy who does the narration, I'll tell you if that's the right one. Uh, so Cryptic is in Auckland, New Zealand. He says he hasn't felt anything. Let me just real quick here. Let me get rid of all these notifications up here. Let me real quick here and go to usgs.gov, USG, USGS earthquake. Okay, it's usgs.earthquake.map. And uh, so I'm going to go there and latest earthquakes, USGS. So I'm sorry, it's earthquake.usgs.gov. And I'm going to go to the worldwide view. And so we have a 3.6 by Boca de, Tuma, de Yuma. We've got the... Uh, 4.5, 52 kilometers southeast of Angorum, Papua New Guinea, uh, 5.7 mid-Indian Ridge, uh, the Aleutian Islands. Let me do world here. And let's take a look here. Uh, so that one there, it looks like it's going to be M5.2 North Island of New Zealand. So the location is 40.23 degrees south, 176.48 east. Uh, but anyhow, that's a uh, 5.2. And uh, then the rest, that's at the Kermadec. Uh, and then the other ones have been in the Kermadec Islands. There we go. Okay. So uh, I'm glad you haven't felt them. That means it's not going to affect you that much. So thank God, goodness somebody's taking care of you. Uh, let me see here. Dragon. Uh, Dragon Slayer, hello. Welcome. Gosh, a lot of comments I need to catch up on. Uh, Mary Greeley News Channel, she does a great job. Um, although her she her, her concepts about Yellowstone, uh, I, I talked with prep, uh, Alpine Preparedness. And Alpine Preparedness is a, a geophysics PhD. So she would be somebody who would really know, understand volcanic and tectonic activity. And... Uh, uh, she, she does not necessarily agree with everything that uh, Mary Greeley puts out. But I will tell you, she does a great job of presenting it. And, and so I would, I would watch her. I would subscribe to her if I were you. I think that's great. So, so the channels I would subscribe to if I were you is Suspicious Observer. Uh, every morning he puts out a three to four minute uh, video on uh, solar activity. I would subscribe to Dutch Sense, D-U-T-C-H-S-I-N-S-E. He puts out a daily uh, report on tectonic, earthquake, uh, volcanic activity going on around the, the world. The guy really is sharp, and he, he is fairly spot on with his predictions of earthquakes that will happen within the next seven to ten days, for example. Um, so let me see. Uh, Suspicious Observer, uh, Dutch Sense, Mary Greeley News. Uh, and then, of course, that earthquakes. Dot, let me get that address for you one more time. That's uh, earthquake.usgs.gov. So that and that will give you all the current earthquakes. Now, I think I also gave you windy.gov or windy.com, windy.com, w-i-n-d-y.com. That shows the prevailing winds for the day, so that you know. When I get up in the morning, I take a look at it just to see: am I going to be affected by any fallout if Houston or San Antonio or Dallas or Fort Hood? Gets, gets hit. Oh, I get, I got to stand corrected. Wokeism has hit the army. It's no longer Fort Hood. It's now Fort Cavazos. Uh, so because General Hood was a Confederate officer. So we can't have any, any posts named in the South after federal, after Confederate generals. Uh, let me see here. So hello, Tofu wasn't aware of all the symbolism in, uh, um, oh, Frank Baum's the, the Wizard of Oz.
Yes, yes. Anything by Stein, Steinbeck is going to be pretty much Grapes of Wrath, Travels with Charlie. Uh, what else did he do there? It, that's uh, in Salina, Kansas. Uh, Salina, uh, Salinas, California, just east of uh, Monterey, which is where Canary Row was. So once a month, it, when I was in language school, we would go down to the John Steinbeck Theater on Canary Row, and we would watch a, uh, we would spend, you know, either an afternoon or a morning, but it was half a day. We would spend watching uh, movies in the language that we were studying. So I got to watch. I went there three, three for three years, so once a month for three years, 36 times. So I did one year's worth of Indonesian and then two years worth of Russian. And that was really interesting down there. So I got to go well, actually walk down Cannery Row, the area that Steinbeck wrote about. <clears throat> but yeah, Steinbeck does write an awful lot about uh, the uh, um, uh, depression area er era stuff. Yeah, that's true. Let me see here. Oh, okay. Thank you, Dragon Slayer. So Dragon Slayer says that... Uh, Claire's video, our YouTube channel is still up with all of her videos on depression era cooking. That's good to hear. Thank you. I just haven't seen anything new for quite a while. Um, and then uh, is this the same thing, uh, let alone prepper? Is this the, or is this a new channel? Is this Claire's channel or is this a new channel that you're saying here? Um, Hello, David Lynn. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So, this is one of those interesting guys that I really want to interview one of these times. Uh, we're going to have to probably do a special thing because he he works pretty hard during the daytime. He's kind of worn out in the evening, but uh, I think he has an awful lot to offer. Um, hello, Tofu. Would you do me a favor? Would you put a link up to his uh, uh, channel? We're trying to get him up. I think he needs just a couple more people to go over 900 subscribers. It would be really great if we can get him over 900 subscribe, subscribers this evening. Uh, I would greatly, greatly appreciate it. So if, if uh, Hello Tofu or um, uh, let me see, who else do we have on here? Scott. Scott's on. Uh, so if, if one of you guys could please put up David Lynn's um, YouTube channel, I would greatly, greatly appreciate that. Of course, if somebody else needs to be followed, please let my moderators know that you want to be followed as well, and they'll put a link to your channel. It's very easy. All they have to do is off to the right side of, of one of your, uh, when you say, I want, I would like to be followed, then there's three dots on there. And if my, my um, moderators can click on those three dots and it says, go to channel, it'll open up a new uh, uh, tab with that channel active, just go up to the URL, copy, paste, come back here and uh, paste it and who they are. And do me a favor and tell us how many subscribers they have, and then we can get them up this evening as well. That would be phenomenal. Let me see what else we have going on here. Uh, okay, so so uh, Dragon Slayer says that Clara reminded her of her grandma. We ate like that as kids. On the farm, we ate lots of potatoes, eggs, and onions, so we ate them. Yes, I, I try to pick up a can of potatoes every time I go to the store. So some of the things you can do, mashed potatoes in a bag, not in the box, in the bag. And, and it's almost like a, a, a uh, airproof bag that they come in. But don't get them with all the other stuff, chives and everything else moved down. You just want straight, plain mashed potatoes, potato flakes. Those will last you a couple years. Those are great. Uh, then we have can, uh, boxes of, um, you know, the, the boxed versions of um, potatoes au gratin and, you know, all those other kinds of things. And those are great. We just had some au gratin potatoes in the box uh, that I had put into my pantry. I'm going to say I think it was July of 2016. Um, it's, it's in one of my previous videos. I mentioned it. But uh uh, scalloped, au gratin potatoes, mashed potatoes. You've got freeze-dried um, hash brown potatoes come in little bitty milk carton type things. You know, we used to be a uh, one pint or half pint uh, milk cartons that, from school. Potatoes are a fantastic thing to have in your uh, <coughs> um, pantry. Thank you, Little Lone Prepper. One of the best books ever of mice and men. Uh, 
John Steinbeck, yes, during the Depression, the Great Depression. Uh, you know, I've got to make sure I get Steinbeck's books to put into my post-apocalyptic uh, reading library because those are just phenomenal. He was such a great writer. Um, and we've got, uh, so David Lynn, there we go. There's David Lynn Prepper's, uh, uh, David Lynn Prep Prince Prepper Principal. God, my mouth is not working. Uh, there's his link, and if you would uh, uh, just add to, he says he's at 806, and he needs a month for 900, but we're going to help him get there some tonight. I am. Uh, let's guarantee him we'll get him at least five more people following him this evening. And uh, so we've got him up there twice. That's great. Uh, and one thing about David that I like is if you subscribe to him, he's going to subscribe back to you if you have a channel. So uh, do I have a Cisco store near me? And, and yes, I have. So I, for those of you who don't know, uh, right during the Katrina time frame, I actually had a disaster response company. So it was what happens is FEMA is not that large of an organization. They don't have that much equipment. They have lots of money. They have a couple people. They sign contracts with major companies, and there's three of them in the U.S., uh, for disaster response. And so those companies are the ones responsible for maintaining the equipment. Uh, so, you know, food tr service trailers or shower trailers or anything like that. Well, they really don't do it either. They subcontract to people like my company. And so I had a food service trailer. I had a 34-foot trailer. And, um, you know, I had a, a six-burner stove. I had three 35-pound uh, deep fat fryers. I had two humongous ovens, a, a humongous microwave, uh, a warming tray, you know, steam tray so people could walk through the line and I could slap things onto the tray as they walked by. Um, I had a griddle. I had a grill. Um, gosh, you know, it's just a, a fantastic trailer. So what happens is they would then pay me to deploy that trailer wherever they were being paid by FEMA to go to. And then when I got there, they would provide me with fuel, electricity, they would provide me with the food, uh, and they would just pay me a certain amount of money to, to, to serve the food that they gave me to the people who came by who was authorized to do it. Now, I always sat up uh, when, they, when they deployed me uh, because of my trailer, the size of it and my speed and capability. I was capable of doing 250 meals an hour. <clears throat> so they always put me with what they call the... Uh, um, <laughs> Any, uh, anyhow, it's a certain type of, of, of insurance adjuster, cat adjuster, uh, catastrophic adjusters. So the cat adjusters basically have their own trailers that they pull behind their vehicles and we'd set up a camp. I would sell them food. I also had kind of like a little exchange trailer where they could go in and buy toothpaste and stuff like that or bottled water or sodas, things like that. Uh, and so we kind of set up a food service and then an exchange or, or a small snack shop, if you will, and uh, sell them things. And then that was only to the catastrophic insurance adjusters. And then, of course, FEMA provided the, the power, the pole lights, the electricity, the fuel, and uh, then Cisco or uh, depending on who it was, it could be Kraft Foods, it could be Benny Keith, it could be any of those major uh, people. I had contracts with them and they delivered us boiling bags. So everything we did was a boiling bag have these humongous five-gallon pots, boil water, throw the bags in. Ten minutes later, it's all warmed up. Rip it open, put it into the steam table, and start scooping it out and putting it on plates. So that's kind of how we did that. Uh, so, yes, and then there's another one there that, that you just have to have, have a membership for, and it's kind of like a, a Costco only for restaurants. And it's called Restaurant Depot. And I have a membership to that as well. Uh, but there is a minimum amount that you can that, that you have to purchase uh, each time you go, and it is cash only. So uh, you know you have to have a membership, and you have to show your tax ID in order to get a membership, showing that you have something to do with the food service industry. But uh, I sold my trailer a long, long time ago, and I still keep my membership up because uh, you know once a member, always a member. <clears throat> I agree, let alone Prepper, just a great writer. And I think, I think, yeah, sometime in, in, in middle school is when I started reading him as well. Uh, yes, 
You know what? Um, so anyhow, the, the internet didn't come up until after I retired from the army to give you an idea. Uh, so, you know, now I, I do remember just before I retired, uh, I had what was called a TCAC, a technical control and analysis center. And this was a TCAC C. So it was core level. I had three of them and we, it was, it was powered, believe it or not, by three brand new IBM 286 computers. And then we had some, uh, uh, PDP 1170 processors. Uh, along with that. So we had six computers in each TCAC, and then we had three TCACs made a core level TCAC. So I had 18. Half of those were PDP 1170s, and half of those were the brand new IBM 286s. And uh, for those of you who don't know, it went uh, the IBM 186, 286, 386, and then we got into <clears throat> what we have now, which are the various forms of. Uh... So that was all MS DOS, and now we're in Windows. Uh, okay. Let me check here. See where we are. Oh, I love the world book encyclopedia. I, I just absolutely loved it. And I would go to the library and just pick out a book and sit and read one of the books of the encyclopedia. That was one of my favorite things to do. And, uh, you know, especially reading about knights and castles and the army and, and history of different battles and stuff like that. It was just phenomenal. Yeah, World Book was fantastic. Mom and Dad bought me a, 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 a uh, uh, encyclopedia. Now, the bad thing about buying an encyclopedia is, you know, it's always outdated one year later. But the, when I was a freshman in high school, at Jesuit high school, they bought me an encyclopedia set. And that was just one of my favorite gifts I've ever had. Uh, you know, I, I, I even I have it now. It's out in the garage. But uh, that was just one of the greatest things I've ever had. Okay. So uh, any questions or ideas or things you would like to talk about? And we can uh, get that out. Tomorrow night, I don't have uh, anybody scheduled for an interview. So if anybody would like to be interviewed, let me know. I have asked Acer Rebrum, uh, Rubrum uh, because he seems to be very, very knowledgeable about earthquakes. So I asked him if, if I can do an uh, interview with him. Uh, I don't know if that will happen tomorrow night or not, but you know, I, I have asked him that. I would also like to interview uh, who's your prepping nurse, David Lynn Prepper. Of course, any of you who, who are, are interested in a particular area or have a particular knowledge on something, I would love to uh, interview as well. I just think exposure is one of the key things that we want to do. One of the things that I'm thinking about doing right now, and, and I'm trying to figure out how I can do it because I haven't figured out yet uh, how to do a lot of editing. I mean, the, the video I did today, I tried it twice on one video recording program and twice on another. None of those went, so I finally did it on my cell phone. But uh, one of the ones that I'm going to be doing here is uh, based off of this. So these are B-17s flying over Germany in World War II. And uh, so this is way before the... Um, what do we want to call it? Conspiracy theory of uh, chemtrails. Uh, before there were chemtrails, these were called contrails, condensation trails. So when you step outside your home and it's a very low temperature and your exhalations are a higher temperature, uh, then you're, as you breathe out, it, that condenses into vapor. And you can see that. And that's what's happening with internal combustion engines or jet engines at high altitude where it's extremely cold. That produces a vapor trail called a condensation trail or contrail. And they've been doing that. Planes have been doing that since the, the strategic bombing of World War II. And we're going to, I'm going to be doing a, a, a video about, you know, are chemtrails real? And uh, are we making more of them than what there are? Because a lot of people are pointing up at the contrails of uh, transcontinental flights, 737, flying from New York City to Los Angeles and claiming that it's a chemtrail. So I'm going to uh, try to explain the difference between the two, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see where we can go with that. Uh, I, I may tick off a lot of people, but, you know, uh, I, I think truth is more important than, uh, than, than people's feelings. We'll see how that goes. Um mm. uh, Okay. 
The other thing I'm thinking about doing is, is and, and this would try to be as educational as possible. Uh, I've noticed that we don't, well, my wife was a teacher, an eighth grade teacher. We don't teach grammar in schools anymore. Uh, so uh, one of the things I'm probably going to do is a couple of videos on declension of nouns, conjugation of verbs. Um, for example, go through the cases, nominative, genitive, dative, accusative. Um, and, and now we used to have one called prepositional, uh, but now that prepositional has been included inside the objective case. Uh, there's a locative case, a locative case in Russian. I don't know. Do we have one in English? Anyhow, we'll go through the cases. Uh, we'll discuss something called a reflexive case. So a reflexive always reflects back to the subject, the nominative case. So I'll be talking about, you know, I uh, call myself. Okay. So I is the subject, the nominative. So myself reflects back to the person, the subject. So myself reflects back to I. I don't call yourself, I call you. You don't call myself, you call me. So there are certain cases for certain pronouns, and myself is not something that other people would use addressing you. Um, so uh, I'm sure Catholic schools still teach them too. I can remember having to diagram sentences for Sister uh, Sister Loris in the seventh and eighth grade in English. And uh, God, I hated diagramming sentences. But anyhow... Um, so do me a favor, Dragon Slayer, get those, get that proof and send me an email with a link to it. I'm always willing to learn if there is, if there is actual scientific proof, uh, do me a favor, get me that information and, and I'll be happy to read it and, uh, we'll see what we can do. I, I just so happen to have uh, this paper that I'm going to recommend that people that I'm going to use as the basis for this is actually, let me see here. It's by, uh, uh, let me see here. Where is my paper? I think that's it right there. That's that aircraft contrail fact sheet. No, that's not it. Oh, I know what it is. I printed it out. So I'm going to be using this paper. That was presented by Dr. Anne Marie Helmenstein. Uh, let me get back over to you to, to StreamYard here. Uh, Dr. Anne Marie Helmenstein. Then she has backup material as is published by, and she gives us her sources for backups. Uh, Timothy Kama's book, uh, EPA Confronts Kim Trails Conspiracy Talk. Uh, M. Kim Johnson's uh, book, Kim Trail Analysis by NMSR Reports. Benjamin Radford, Curious Contrails, Death from the Sky the, by the Skeptical Inquirer. Oliver Smith, Incredible Contrail Made by Boeing 787. What causes contrails and are they part of the global conspiracy? Uh, as printed in the Telegraph. And then finally, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, September 2000, Aircraft Contrails Fact Sheet. So that's what I'll be using as my basis for uh, my, my discussion about these chemtrails uh, that we use to win World War True. okay? All these uh, uh, terrible chemicals that came out of the back end of, of gas-burning engines at high altitudes. So uh, I know it'll tick some people off. But anyhow, uh, so now there are, uh, we do have rain cloud seeding, which is not typically, and, and that has started off right here in the beginning. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, chemtrails, on the other hand, are chemical trails purportedly resulting from international intentional high altitude release of chemical or biological agents. While you might think chemtrails would include crop dusting, cloud seeding, and chemical drops for fire fighting, the term is only applied to illicit activities as part of a conspiracy theory. So the ones that show the chemicals and everything else, that, you know, most of those have been from cloud seeding operations, uh, firefighting operations, or from um, other things that we can, we can uh, prove and, 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 and identify. But typically, chemtrails, people are going to point up in the skies at the contrails and say that's a chemtrail. So that's, that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, but I would love to see your proof. Please send me an email with it, uh, and we'll see what we can do. 
There is a grammar book I have been meaning to get, Woe is I. Have you read it? No, I haven't. But I still have my high school English grammar book, English books. So I, I may be using those. Although I, I know things change over time, you know, and so I graduated from high school 53 years ago. So I'm sure things have, have changed since then. Uh, yes, we are no longer teaching cursive writing in schools either. And it's kind of funny. Um, so if you take a look at the morphology of, of handwriting, what I learned in Catholic school versus what you uh, learn in your school, uh, I bet if I show you, we can see... Uh, the difference. So I learned to make my capital G this way. But if you take a look at it, if you take this part here, the initial loop, uh, that's very similar to this initial loop. Then you come down here and you got this drop down here that comes up here. And that's this over here, this high part over here. And then it comes down and comes back across just like the bottom here. So originally it was this way hundreds of years ago. And it's morphed into this for a capital G. So we do, I do a couple uh, letters differently than the public schools do. And, uh, you know, but, and the J is backwards of a G, by the way. So let me see. I don't, uh, Pepper Principal, I don't know, did you, were you taught that same thing? We make our R's different. There are a couple things we make different. I make my E's different. Um, so, I'll have to give you a, a cursive writing class to, as well. Yeah, cloud seeding is very common, and that's going to be to try to induce rain. So what they're doing is they're putting in silver oxide uh, into the clouds and uh, trying, or actually up into the atmosphere, trying to form the clouds, then get precipitation from that. So that that is uh, cloud seeding, and that is a very common activity. It's been done for since. Gosh, since we had high altitude aircraft, probably 1945 or so. Uh, Pat Butler, no, you are fine. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. Always good to see you. Great, great. Thank you very much. I would greatly appreciate that. And and like I like like. Like I started off this evening, if I say something wrong, like Asa Rubram corrected me, I will admit that I'm wrong. You know, I, I, I am I am not so proud as to say I know everything or that I'm an expert in everything. I if, if somebody comes up with proof and 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 counters what I currently believe, I'm always willing to accept it and, and to change my mind uh, based upon scientific proof. So thank you very much. I would greatly appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to it. Um, I would prefer to see peer-reviewed stuff, but uh, you know, I, I will take a single author. Like, like peer. And when I say peer-reviewed, that's you know, when you have a, a PhD who's writing a paper who gives sources that are at least five or six different sources long, uh, who agree with her or she's drawing her uh, conclusions from. I, I prefer that kind of stuff rather than some one person who just says. You know, I could I could put a paper out tomorrow and say I'm a PhD in something and, and, and claim to be a, an expert, but I'm not. I'm not an expert in anything. That's that's terrible. I wish I was. Uh, I, I guess I'm an expert at pissing people off. <laughs> that's I can do that fairly easily and fairly well. Uh, so David Lynn says he was at a Catholic school in Mission, Texas. I was at a Catholic school in El Paso, Texas. So I went to elementary and middle school. Uh, was Blessed Sacrament on the corner of uh, Hondo Pass and Diana uh, in El Paso, zip code 79924. And uh, then I went to high school at Jesuit High School in El Paso. And then they went bankrupt my sophomore year and closed. And I graduated from Burgess High School in El Paso. Uh, at that time, one of the largest high schools around. It was a, a big 4A. Now we have 5As. And so it's nothing like what it was. My nuns were, were Franciscan uh, for elementary and, and middle school, and uh, the priests were diocesan. And then uh, when I went to high school, the priests were Jesuit. Irish Sisters, the Incarnate Word. Gosh, I bet. Did they teach you uh, Gaelic? Wow, wow. Okay, so you get, you managed to go all the way through. I only did 10 years. And uh, so 
And uh, I can still remember, we had to go to mass every day at 11 o'clock. So I can still remember most of the mass in Latin. Um, we, uh, in, in El Paso, uh, if you go to the Northeast uh, Public Library, and well, this was Northeast when I was there, it was right off of Rushing and Dyer in El Paso, there was a public library. And when they did the public library, they had all these tiles in the entrance way. And the tiles were from art classes from the third grade of all the different elementary schools, you know, within a one mile or two mile radius of the library. My sister uh, was in the third grade at that time. And she did one of the, the, the paintings on a piece of tile and they glazed it. And so her artwork uh, is in the entryway of that uh, public library in El Paso, the Northeast uh, Public Library. Uh, near rushing and dire. Um, yeah, in, in high school, I took Latin and Spanish as well. Uh, and it's funny because the, the, you know, the declension and conjugation were very, very similar. Uh, and so that was a very good, that was a very good combination to have. Um, Storms radius and chats. Hello. Welcome from central Kentucky. Um, me too. <laughs> uh, so, um, so anyhow, and I married one of those girls and then I left the church for a short while, became a Southern Baptist and they said, I, I, I should be a minister. So I became a, a Southern Baptist minister. And that lasted until we got divorced. The unforgivable sin in the Southern Baptist convention is being divorced. So, uh, I lost that and I could no longer be a minister in the Southern Baptist convention. So I returned back to the Catholic church since I was single and didn't have a uh, anything to keep me hooked to the Baptist church and uh, have been there ever since. Now, uh, Helen is Methodist. So I do go to the Methodist church with her and she comes to the Catholic church with me. Now, most people don't realize it. Okay. Uh, but here's something very, very interesting. Let me grab my glasses so I can read it to you. Uh Uh, one cannot, this is from the Catholic catechism. Okay. Uh, and I've got it highlighted here. However, one, this is paragraph 818. However, one cannot charge with the sin of the separation. That is the separation of Luther and all the others, 1517, Calvin, 1523, I think. But those separationists we call Protestants or Protestants, uh, however, one cannot charge with the sin of the separation those who at present are born into these communities that resulted from such separation and in them are brought up in the faith of Christ and the Catholic Church accepts them with respect and affection as brothers. All who have been justified by faith in baptism, in baptism are incorporated into Christ. They therefore have a right to be called Christians and with good reason are accepted as our brothers in the Lord by the children of the Catholic Church. So for those of you who say that we think we're the only ones who are going to be there, the catechism itself says that we recognize those who broke away from the Catholic Church as being rightful Christians, and they will enjoy salvation with us. So um, that's kind of one of those common things you hear that we can debunk right there reading the, uh, the catechism or basically what, what the rules are. Yeah, my mother was Catholic too. Uh, my father wasn't so. Uh, we have we have an awful lot in common. We got and we both like tacos. I got to get you up here and show you, take you to Tio Dan's uh, uh, breakfast tacos. I uh, I, I put out. I was watching Prepper Dog today, and uh, you know, and and he had a he had a fantastic video he put out about the status of his wife, and then he had a great scripture at the end. And so I asked him a simple question. I said, "Hey, are, are you familiar with Mark six? Grab my Bible, Mark six. What is it in Mark six? That what is it, thirty-one, I believe." Um, Let me grab it here. Let me see if I can find it real quick for you. I don't want to keep you too long while I look stuff up. But uh, 
is it Mark 6? Anyhow, um, Jesus is before the uh, uh, Sanhedrin, or the, 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 uh, the rabbis are asking him questions. Oh, here we go. It, I'm sorry, it's Mark 12. And uh, Mark 12, verses uh, 29 through 31. And most people don't realize this, but but if, if, we, if we take a look at it, it says, which is the first of all the commandments is what the rabbi is asking Jesus. And he says, the first is this. And then we get into the Shema. And the Shema is the prayer that the Jews were required to recite daily. They were required to write it on a little bitty scroll, have it on their wrists, have it on their foreheads, have it embedded. It's the Shema is also on the doorpost of every house, every Jewish house. So this is the Shema. And this is what Jesus is saying. The first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. So the second commandment is the one that Jesus gave us, and it says, "There, uh, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There are no other commandments greater than these. And so if we take a look at it, he's reinforcing the ancient Jewish tradition of the Shema, you know, of loving God the Father, at the same time reinforcing it and adding to it that you need to love your neighbor. So uh, I, I just think that's phenomenal and, and uh, great little thing if you want to get into it. Um, Charms, radios, and cats, you're quite welcome. We would ask that you go back and check on the other channels. We're trying to, we try to support each other as much as possible. And uh, so, you know, my, my moderators do a good job of putting out everybody's uh, uh, channels, uh, URLs. And so it's always great. Well, if we can get you two or three more new, new people following you today, that would be our goal. Uh, so let me see here. Um, Scott got Kill It and Grill It's. Uh, and then, uh, so Little on Prepper grew up in a fire and brimstone independent Baptist church. They thought everything was a sin. Um, I have a I have a very close friend. We worked together. We were both directors of training, in different divisions, at Dell. And uh, she, her parents were uh, Presbyterian uh, missionaries in Thailand, and she grew up in Thailand. Came to the U.S. She got her Th.D. Doctor in theology. She had a Ph.D. and a Th.D. And she, her PhD was in andragogy or adult learning. And her PhD, Dr. Theology, was, of course, in, in theology. And so we used to sit and just talk about religion for hours on end. And she told me that the, that the Catholic Church is the church of guilt, uh, that everything is a sin for Catholics and we have to confess about it. You know, and, and uh, whereas she didn't belong to a, to a religion of guilt. So I guess your Baptist church and, and my Catholic church are very similar in the fact that both of them, everything is a sin. You know, uh, everything's guilty, so. Okay, so we're at 9 o'clock. Listen, tomorrow night probably will not be long. I don't have anybody to interview uh, unless we talk about chemtrails and contrails. And I'll look forward to uh, an email, uh, hopefully with a link to uh, to a paper that says that chemtrails are, are true, uh, that they have scientific evidence of them. In the meantime, I'm going to go with the scientific evidence that I have. And uh, so I may discuss chemtrails tomorrow night at the, on the Wednesday. Don't forget that next uh, Monday I am in class again. So this is the class I'm taking uh, on Monday nights. So this is uh, uh, Bishop Robert Barron's Seven Deadly Sins and Seven Lively Virtues. So uh, every sin has a virtue you can use to overcome that sin. So that's Mondays from 8 to 9.30. Or still, I'm sorry, 7 to 8.30. So we're not having Monday nights still. We're going to be on Wednesday nights. And uh, then uh, Tuesday nights is the nonfiction book club. This coming Thursday is our fiction book club. And we're finishing up book six of a American series, which is Enforcing Home. Gosh, this is a good one. Uh, so be with us to discuss that. Of course, next month we'll be doing book seven of his. So that's kind of where we are for everything we got going on. So let's go back to Numbers chapter six. Uh, da, 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 da. Numbers chapter 6, verses 24, 25, and 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you kindly and give you peace. And as a reminder, my fancy uh, book um, mark that was provided to me by Little Lone Prepper's son 
and uh, do me a favor. Uh, as we read in Mark, uh, you know, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Please remember that we're all in this together. We're all one family. We need to support each other. We need to be kind, polite, and respectful to each other because togetherness is the key. And so love and togetherness is what's going to see us through this. Everybody, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the great discussion. Thank you for your questions. Thank you to my fantastic, phenomenal, outstanding, superior moderators. Couldn't do it without you. Everybody, please be safe. Take care. Good night.